and welcome to another episode of Happy Mum, Happy Baby, the podcast. Um, today's guest I stumbled across on Instagram and I was instantly pulled in and um, because her route to motherhood is a little less traditional than most, than many, uh, and I just wanted to know more and I'm absolutely, I just love seeing photos of her and her son. Uh, it is the amazing Lives Alone, who is actually called Liv Thorne and I never knew that until today on Skype. Yeah, I don't have a jazzy Salone surname. It's a shame. I know, I know. Hello. Thorn, Thorn is strong. Hi, how are you? Good, fine, thank you, fine. Dealing with just... uh, lockdown like everyone else. And a move. And a move, yeah. Yeah. But, you know, we'll just breathe through it. Worst things are going on. It's all good. So tell me about your childhood. What was that like? Uh, I had a great childhood to be honest um but it was a it was in two halves basically because um I grew up with I've got I'm one of four mum and dad were happily married we grew up in the country you know nice garden so it was all very busy a lot going on mum and dad were really social um and then uh, when I was eight my mum got diagnosed with breast cancer so then from the age of eight everything changed really um, obviously, uh, but equally because I was so young, I didn't know any different. You know that actually quite sadly, it's that that became quite normal. Um, that Mum was going in for treatment, and she used to tell me various things about why she was going and all that sort of stuff. Um, but yeah, generally, I mean, apart from the shitness of cancer, <laughs> my my childhood was um, you know I was really lucky. We had a really lovely family unit um, and then my dad actually got ill after my mum um, got better he had uh, asbestos poisoning I don't oh, know wow. I don't know the real name well I do but I don't know how to pronounce it mesothelomania I, that's not right but you know um, asbestos poisoning for he was a farmer um, so he uh, got it from that and so then he got ill and he died when I was 12. Um, and then mum got poorly again after he died. And she died when I was 17. So whilst my childhood was pretty idyllic in some ways, actually looking back, madly traumatic. But because it started so young, I think I thought lo it was quite normal. Um, mm. you, do you know what I mean? You don't know what other people are going through, you know. Where are you in the order of siblings? Uh, I'm the youngest. And I am such a youngest child, honestly. <laughs> I am, yeah, I'm definitely the youngest. And by quite a long way. My mum, there was, there's sort of seven years in between. Us, the next one up is seven years and then another seven years. Oh, wow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then 18 months. So she started at 17 and finished at 32. So she started with two 18 months apart. Yeah. So she, she properly went for I it mean, there. Yeah. <laughs> and then realised what she'd done, took seven years off and then started again. Crazy <laughs> fool. Uh, or she knew what she was doing. I don't know. I don't know. Um, so, yeah, I'm very much the youngest. Um, and, and actually, that's, it's sort of quite weird because my eldest siblings are 14 and 15 years younger than me, um, older than me. So because, for example, my dad died when I was 12, my brother was 27... He then sort of became, he didn't know whether to be my brother or my dad or my friend or, you know, just. Yeah. So, and that's always been quite, com well, not complicated that it's made any difference to anything or been awkward. Just it's quite a complicated dynamic when, and looking at it now, if I was 27 and I had a 12 year old sibling and we had no parents, you're just like, God, that must have been horrid for them as well. Just not knowing how to protect me or, or what the boundaries were or, you know, that kind of thing. Just really odd. It must be really interesting looking back now, all being adults and seeing your different versions of what happened at that time. Yeah, it is weird. And there, and also because there's so much, uh, there's such an age gap that um, they moved out when I was quite young. So, so we didn't all live together for years and years. 
like a lot of families do, and they have really different memories of things. So I'll be like, oh, God, Mum was a shit cook. And everyone's like, no, she wasn't. She was amazing. I'm like, well, not by the time she got to me. She, you know, <laughs> just those kind of things. We have really different uh, takes on it because it was just, yeah, it, it was a very different time for each of us. So from when you were 17, so after your mum passed away, yeah. who did you live with then? So then it gets a little complicated. So I moved in with some family friends and for one reason or another that didn't work out. I remember we mm-hmm. chose them because they were good friends and they had children my age. Um, but uh, and, and they, they had dinner at the table every night together as a family. And mum and I were a bit obsessed with that. Like that. I really remember that being something that I was looking forward to in a way. Um, after she died, it was something that I really, but for one reason or another, that kind of broke down. Um, and then I moved in with my sister and her husband. They were 24 and had just got married. Uh, they got married quite young because mum, because they wanted mum to be around. Um, and yes, yeah, so I moved in with them in Hackney and, and then went off to uni because... It was somewhere to go. Um, and that's what you did. Uh, yeah. So I went off to uni, but, but it was always my sister's house that was sort of home at that time. But it meant that I really wanted a home, to get a home, to have somewhere called home, So, which I think is why the move, I, I've just moved last week, and it really affected me. And I think it's because I just, I, I need somewhere to just be or know that I'm really safe, that's mine and has all my things, and you know. Um, and and I didn't realise that until I moved last week, and I was like, oh, God. And I d- haven't found anywhere to live, so I'm renting somewhere. And so it just all felt a real, like, whoa, 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 what's going on in the middle of a pandemic when I couldn't say goodbye to my neighbours and all that sort of stuff. And yeah. I realised it's because, actually, when after that sort of four or five years after Mum died, there was no there, nowhere that was totally mine. Mm. Well, it's a huge thing, isn't it? If you think you were only 17, 18. Oh, yeah, looking at it now. And you've got nowhere that is yeah. a home, that's yeah. your base, that's your yeah. go-to place where you feel the most comfortable and yeah. at ease. Absolutely. And they did. that's not to say that I n- never felt comfortable or at home at my sister's house, but I was really aware that they were 24 and they just got married. Like, they didn't need me <laughs> chugging along like, hiya. Um, and they needed to live their life, but wanted to make sure I was safe and happy and all that sort of stuff. So, um, yeah, I never felt like I was homeless or anything like that. I was always mm. really lucky. It's just it never felt uh, like mine. Like, like, you know, when you, I suspect when people go back to their parents now, they just, uh, in my head, people revert back to being much more childlike you know because you're at your family home or you know whatever you just sit there waiting for things to happen um, yeah 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 that's... I still ask I still ask for a biscuit if I go over to my mum's yeah, house I'm like can I have exactly, a biscuit <laughs> that's exactly how I imagine it to be and uh, and so yeah it's things like that that there was nowhere I could go I don't know but it, yeah it's it, it, it was a weird time it was a really weird time so growing up, what did you ever look ahead at yourself as a mum and having your own family? Yeah, I was obsessed with being a mum from really early on. And I think, my, as I've said, my siblings are much older than me. So I was an auntie from the age of 12. Um, and so I'm, I'm closer in age to my niece than I am to my sister. Um, right. And then they constantly had more I've got 10 nieces and nephews so there was constantly children around um and also my just con- my want to have a home that that became a thing that I was going to get a husband definitely then have kids loads of kids uh, in my university yearbook I was going to be um they wrote most likely to be Pippa Ross from Home and Away who yes you know the woman who everyone just came to she got anyone that passed through summer bay suddenly ended up living with pippa and they and everyone just assumed i'd be like that so i was always quite maternal um it just never happened uh it didn't that isn't how it worked out at what point did you decide to kind of what when did the idea of using a sperm donor come up 
Uh, it's a weird one because you... I joke about it all the time because a lot of my friends got married quite young, um, you know, early 20s, so they'd have a kid by the time they were 26. And I was like, oh, that's fine. I've still got loads of time, still got loads of time. And then I remember having a conversation with a friend just going, oh, I think I'm going to... I'll just get a donor, you know. <laughs> Wouldn't that be funny, getting a donor? As if that's going to happen, you know. Um and then I remember saying, oh, yeah, by the time I'm 35, then I'm going to have a donor. That's just fact. Um, but I didn't really believe it still. I didn't. I guess, was it kind of like one of those, you know, when you say to a mate, if we're not married by the time we're 40, you're Exactly in. that. Yeah, all of my, I can't remember what they're called. Uh, I can't remember what that phrase is that they're called. But all of my boyfriends who I'd made that pact with, went off and got married. And I'm like, whoa, 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 <laughs> this isn't the deal. Please don't do that, guys. Um, yeah, and the more that that kind of happened, um, it became more and more apparent that I needed to do something else, like, heaven forbid, find someone. Was there a yearning to, to be a mum? Was oh. that the thing that was spurring you on? Or was it the fact that, you know, finding a partner wise that wasn't happening and even then you kind of feel like it, it, when you find someone that you think you can take that step with you need to wait another two years yeah. until you know you, that you're even there yeah that's what I like I always said dating being a mother was so in the forefront of my mind that it would just be like hey I'm Liv I'd love a gin and tonic and I'm fertile tomorrow you know it's that kind of <laughs> it becomes this horrible like race to um and dating was hideous enough anyway, let alone putting that pressure on it. Um, so the yearning for to be a mother was much more than um, wanting a partner. I mean, I wanted both, um, but but the I don't know how to describe it. When so when friends would get together with partners, I'd be thrilled for them. But if you told me you're pregnant that's like someone is kicking you in the stomach every time, every time. Um, and so that, so in that respect, it's a different longing. It's a different kind of yearning. Yeah, having a partner would be amazing, but I wanted a baby. Like, it was really primal, um, is the only way I can describe it. So what, when you started realising that it maybe wasn't just a jokey thing. Yeah. Was there a point where you started taking it more seriously? And at what point did you go, do you know what? I'm going to read it. up on it. I'm going to go to the doctors. Like, where do you even start? Um, it's funny. I'm actually writing a book about it now. I've got a, um, I've got a book deal to talk about it. Amazing. Um, yeah, which is amazing. But it's making me really look into again, all the things that I'd sort of forgotten um, and how I did go about it because I'm a real Torian and just bull in a china shop, I make a decision, I go. Doesn't always mean that I've done all the groundwork, it's I'm making yeah. it happen. Um, but I was in, the moment I knew, I was at a friend's barbecue, it was my godson's birthday and we were in the garden and there were I don't know, maybe 10 kids around, as there always are, because all of my friends have children. Um, and I just sat in the middle of their massive garden with my 18-month-old godson, I think he must have been by then, just crying on my own. And my, her, my godson's mum came and sat next to me and just went, it's time. And I was like, yeah. And that was it. I drove away kind of knowing that I had to just not keep thinking because there's that thing that everyone goes Mr Wright will come along yeah like will he you know and if you don't think about it he'll just walk through the door you're like oh my god please like really does that actually happen probably not um and if you're slightly older and you're single and all of your friends are married with children you naturally go out less yeah um, and so meeting people naturally becomes less and less. And I'm a massive, I have really severe anxiety of everything in the world. Um, so I didn't go out that much anyway. And so it was becoming um, 
going out was becoming more of a, um, a problem, I guess, too. And so um, meet it, I knew that meeting someone was just becoming bloody unlikely. So I had to do the only other thing I knew, and that was to get a donor. Yeah. It still makes me feel funny about when I made Does that decision. It? Yeah, not about having a donor baby at all. Um, about when I just when I knew I was going to do it, like I was so excited and so terrified. Um, I suspect again, I wouldn't know, but I suspect it's a bit like when you're a couple and you're like, "Yeah, we're going to start trying," and you're a bit like, "Whoa, shit." <laughs> you know, we're on the ride now, what do we do? And you've no idea what's coming. You're excited, you're terrified. Have you put the seatbelt on? You know, all of that kind of... Um, and I still, yeah, I can feel that tangibly now, that kind of nervous energy. Um, did, you know, did you know anyone who'd gone through it themselves? No, I didn't. But actually you can... Um, there are, there's a, um, the Donor Conception Network which is a really good resource for donor-conceived babies uh, and any which way that happens, you know. Um, and I didn't know about it at the time, but now if I was to advise people, I'd say go there because you can. there are a lot of groups that you can join for that are really private um, and you can be anonymous if you want and that kind of thing. Um, but I didn't know anyone to ask. But one of my friends is a... Oh God, I'm definitely going to say this wrong. Embryologist, right? Um, and so she kind of knew the technical download of it. So I could ask her questions like, "What do I need to do? You know, do I need to?" And she she just because it's her job, she was just like, "Oh, yeah. this happens, and then this happens." And you're like, "Oh, okay, cool." So I just need to buy some sperm. She's like, "Yeah, I'm like, okay." <laughs> and then I googled. I googled. Uh, fertility clinics and the first one that answered the phone and sent me some information was the one I went to which is really stupid <laughs> looking back like a clinic you really need to have a great relationship with them you need to feel comfortable there you need to uh, yeah feel like you want to go that you trust these people whereas actually the clinic I went to wasn't a good fit for me at all. Um, it was a business. The fertility industry is a business. They all charge you for anything. Um, there are some that are brilliant, um, but there are others where the the um, bedside manner, I think, maybe the yeah. phrase, is, leaves a lot to be desired. They forget they're dealing with really bloody vulnerable people. Um, and then the, the sperm, I googled sperm banks. And that, so do you do that separately, the fertility clinic and the yeah. sperm bank? You don't get the sperm via the, di the um, clinic? You have you to do it can. separately? You can. You can. It's like everything. There are a billion ways to do it. You can get it from um, your clinic, and so everything is there. Um, but the UK, we have quite a... Like, donating your sperm is not a normal thing to do, like... Still, if you say, if I say now to a man, he's a sperm donor baby, they'll all be like, <laughs> you say it to a woman, they're totally different, but men are just like, woo, sperm, woo. You're like, oh my God. Um, and so, and in England, it's a really weird thing. Uh, still, like, I don't know any guys that have donated sperm in the UK. Um, and so the pool here to choose from is much smaller. So I yeah. knew, well, after a while, I found out that I need, I'd need to go abroad. Um, and at the time, there was a documentary about Danish sperm. And again, being the incredible researcher that I am, didn't do any, <laughs> uh, just watched a documentary. I was like, brilliant. You know, if it's normal, more normalised there, then there'll be a bigger pool to choose from. Um, and you, had to, you have to check that they're registered with the HFEA, which is the Human Fertility and Embryologist Association, possibly. Works for me. Um, but it's, you know, it's the um, association for all things fertility. 
um, to make sure that certain things are done right. So sperm is, um, oh, sperm donors are checked for certain things and screened and all of that kind of stuff. Um, so then you have to check that your clinic will accept sperm from your donor clinic. It's a real minefield and as some people go abroad to have the whole thing done um, because it ends up being cheaper sometimes and also you're more relaxed I guess if you're yeah um, and but it's I mean it's so subjective and and dependent on each person on how you do it and also how uh, your fertility is that's the thing is like as most mothers know you either get pregnant really easily or or it's just the biggest struggle in the world and and people don't know why or how or um and it's the same with fertilization of any how whichever way it's done um there are a billion different ways it can be done and you just have to look into the best way for you because it could be that you're doing it because you're single like me or because um you're in a gay relationship or because you're having you're in a couple but you're having fertility problems and um, there are a thousand reasons why you could be mm. getting a donor of any sort you could be double donor so it's donor sperm and donor egg um yeah it's a minefield so once you decided danish <laughs> yeah what do you find out about the donors like how detailed how far do they go into telling you about them and how do you choose like what are you looking for when you're when you're reading I know it's a re that's a really personal thing but no. what was drawing you in and what was kind of making you go Meh. well it changes after you know you go into something like that thinking oh I want you know and actually then you're like I know be serious now this is <laughs> this is a real life you know um and so basically you get the, the sperm bank I used, again, there's very different levels of information you get depending on where you get your sperm. But the sperm bank I used, you get a baby photo of the donor. So not older, but a baby photo, which is vaguely pointless because, I mean, <laughs> it looks like they did when they were a baby. Uh, and, then you, and then everything, G, you everything. So maternal, paternal, grandparents, height, weight, occupation, what they died of, hair colour, eye colour, um, everything. And then the donor themselves, they uh, what their favourite childhood memory was, their favourite colour, favourite song. Like, it's quite intense. But yeah. then but then, do you cancel someone out because they say they love a song that you hate? Or, you know, it's just all <laughs> a bit... You've become a bit mental. You're like, oh, God, no, they've mentioned ABBA. No, no, no. You know, then you're like, no, that really means nothing, you know. I think I read somewhere as well that you said you even... They even share their fears. Yeah. Which is an interesting one. Yeah, things that they're scared of or... Um, what else did you find out? And, and I... And the reason why they became a donor which was fascinating. So, um, yeah, they, they write you a letter as to why they're a donor and then they read that letter out so you can hear their voice, which is quite mad. I know. Oh, wow. I know. It's fascinating. But, of course, to me, they sound beautiful in Danish because they don't sound... <laughs> do you know what I mean? It's that thing that anyone with, uh, with an accent different to yours is just like, oh, wow, how intriguing. Uh, yeah. So, so you get a lot of information and I went in just being like, oh, I want someone, you know, who sounds nice and is handsome uh, or, you know, whatever. And then three days later, I was like, actually, my family is riddled with cancer. I just need to find someone that doesn't have genetic history of cancer. Although obviously you can't limit cancer. There's, if I felt I could get someone as healthy as possible, that's what I went for. Plus, tall and thin to counteract my short and fat. I was like, <laughs> yes, please. That's what I need. If I get to choose, we're going tall and thin, please. So, yeah, so there is a little bit of, you know, fun. Well, not fun, that's not the right word. But, yeah, you, there's a lot of information. It's quite daunting. It's really daunting. 
Did you um, feel a pull towards the one that you eventually landed on? Yeah, really weirdly. Um, and there are th- there are certain things I'm not going to say just because obviously it's personal to her. But yes, yeah. There are certain things that they said in there that I was like, oh, OK, you know. Um, I guess it would be like if you went on a date and a guy said something that really resonated with you and you'd be like, mm, yeah, OK. Um, and it, which is ridiculous because you're not in a relationship with this person and there's nothing to say that what they were saying in this online form would would come down into your, your child, but it, there was something reassuring about it. I imagine as well there's there must be something in the fact that that person is in a, in a different way going to be part of your life forever. Yeah. So in yeah. a way to have the, those feel like some sort of feelings of I don't know not a romantic feeling but, but no not at all but a feeling of admiration for them at, uh, yeah. maybe I just kind actually of... felt very comfortable mm. with him. Uh, ridiculously with his form not him um yeah I just there was nothing in there that made me think he sounded like a dick or was an unkind person and the reasons he said he was doing it came from a good place and that's what made me feel like really comfortable with even though then I was like oh my god have I done the right thing but I mean he know you know so when you got your sperm yeah. All right. Did it all right? I'm guessing it went straight to the clinic. It went straight to the clinic. I okay. did think it was coming to me then. I was like, shit, what am I going to do with it? <laughs> and actually, you can do insemination at home yourself. So a lot of people, because that cost, that takes out the, the clinic cost. Um, but I would have dropped it, thrown it up a wall, done it at the wrong time. So I was like, no, I need to get clinic involved because otherwise it's not going to go well. Um, but yeah, it goes straight to the clinic. That must have been a weird trip, going to the clinic, knowing that the like, IUI was going to take place. I know. It's really, um, it's really emotional. It is really emotional and odd. Um, and I, like I say, my fertility journey was actually really easy once I decided to do it. And because I had um, IUI, which is basically putting the sperm, so they wash the sperm so that they get rid of all the little tired, grumpy ones. And they've just got, (laughs) they've just got the shit hot ones left. And then they (laughs) inject them straight into your uterus. Um, So it is, it's just like a smear test. But you must have been, you must have been gearing yourself up and then literally in a minute it's it's done. Literally a minute. Yeah. And let me just pass over all my cash. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, it is literally a minute, but I didn't do, you can do assisted IUI, which means you take drugs, a bit like an IVF, but IUI is much less invasive. Um, it's also much less successful, but there was no reason for me to believe that I had fertility issues. I just didn't have a penis near me at a regular <laughs> interval. Do you know what I mean? It was like, that was, that was my fertility issue. <laughs> Was there was no naked man Just near me? Willy. Yeah, that was it. <laughs> so, um, so there was no need. And again, they they tried to push that I have um, hormone drugs, and I was right. a bit like, actually, at this stage, I don't want to try. I want to see if I can do it naturally. Um, and I was really lucky. <coughs> Sorry. Um, yeah, I was really lucky that on the fourth go. It worked, which is... You did have four goes. Yeah. And it's a bloody miracle, to be honest, because four goes in the the scheme of fertility, if you think about that in terms of a, quote-unquote, normal couple, that's you having sex four times and getting pregnant. So, I mean, I will always be very, very grateful for how lucky I was with that. So lucky. So bloody lucky. Um, but so yeah. how many, how many, did you have to kind of divide the sperm up or did you, does it come in different loads to give you different tries? How does that work? Uh, you get, a, 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 it's a vial a go. So okay. you buy however many you think. And then they do, again, they can do 
bundles of three for one or, you know, and you're just like, Jesus Christ. And you don't know at that stage. You're like, am I throwing away thousands of pounds if I buy three, but I only need one? Or Is sperm really expensive? Really expensive. And then the shipping and then once you've shipped it to a clinic, the clinic charge you to store it. You know, just it's constant. So it in itself isn't... I mean, it is really prohibitive, actually. The whole... The, I get why people don't do it through, again, quote-unquote, official channels. And they, you know, there are... You can buy sperm on Facebook. And there are prolific sperm donors. And I, I get why people are forced to do that. Because what I've done is a really privileged thing to be able to do. That I had the finances to do that. It's a really privileged thing to be able to do. And and I get why people... It makes me really sad why that people have to go down routes that they may not feel safe with. They may feel totally fine with it, but there are some that don't, but they can't... They can't get those funds together because it is criminally expensive. And then if you don't buy enough sperm of the donor that you've chosen, will there be... It, will he still be there? So then you you might have to go through the whole process of um, choosing again. If you've tried, you didn't get enough sperm, you're dead set on that donor. Will he still be there? You know, which I had. On the fourth go, I didn't have any sperm left. And I left it for months and months because I was too terrified to go on the site to see whether he was still there. Because I didn't want to assume that he was there and then I would have been devastated devastated if he if if it hadn't been if he hadn't been there did you feel differently after the fourth go at all did you did anything about you kind of go this this might be it or uh, because I know we're sort of saying that you know loads of people go through various tries and it doesn't work but I think each time when you're trying and it doesn't work your heart breaks and sinks and and so fourth time round had you let yourself go there mentally or had you already kind of in your head gone well if it works it works and kind of almost detached from it or were you every time just kind of going come on uh the first time I was come on this is it it's fine in and out done I'll be pregnant even though secretly I totally knew I wouldn't be. But, like, it was ridiculous. I went and got a bikini wax done. I had my nails done. I had my hair done. I got the train up and had a, you know, nice lunch beforehand and made it a real deal, like, made it into a real thing. Because I went from Oxford to London to my clinic because it happened to be cheaper. Um, and, yeah, and I was there and I was really excited and nervous and, you know, all that sort of stuff. And when... The first one didn't take. I was devastated. Like I, yeah, it's just the most heartbreaking thing. And there's no one that under people think they understand, but actually, unless you're a single mum on your own doing it on your own, no one else cares as much as you. There isn't that other person that cares as much. Of course, they care, but it isn't the kind of acute pain that you feel together. And that I felt really lonely then when I when I found out that I wasn't pregnant that time. And then the second and third times again, like I got my friend to drive me up so that I didn't because I'm not the best traveller. And I was like, yeah, if you drive me up, I'll feel really just chill and it'll all be fine. And that, and that didn't work. And after the third attempt, I was like, I'd always said I'd do four attempts and then IVF. Um and after the third attempt, I did a six-month break. But because I'm as stubborn as an ox, I was like, no, I am going to do the fourth one. I'll buy more sperm, and that'll be that. And I, when I went onto the site, and his, the donor was still there, and I got it over. And I was like, it's not going to work. It's fine. I don't actually care that it's not going to work this time. I'm going to prepare for IVF. But I have to do it, because I said I would, and I'm stubborn. And... So I didn't do any of those bloody ovulation tests. I didn't wee on any sticks. I just knew when I was ovulating in my head. I just knew. 
and I phoned the clinic and was like, I'm coming up tomorrow morning and drove up to London, parked on Harley Street, in, out, done. Went home, got a Burger King. Haven't had a Burger King for like 15 years, literally. <laughs> went home, watched a couple of, it was the weekend and so I was watching just crap telly and staying at home. Um, and I was so convinced that it hadn't worked that when it was tight, so the two week wait wasn't really dramatic because I knew I wasn't pregnant, so it didn't matter. And then I took the test at my brother's house. He wasn't there, I was with my nieces um, who were in their 20s. I wasn't like scarring any three year olds. Um, <laughs> uh, I was, and I took it and I just weed on the pregnancy stick went off, had a bath, um, went and had breakfast, and then was like, oh, God, I did that test. I'd forgotten. And then went and checked it and was like, oh, my God. And there was a lot of screeching, like, yeah, a lot of screeching and not believing it was real after the... Just, I was so convinced that it wasn't going to work. And I, now, looking back, I think it was me trying not to well me not being stressed about it was possibly what made it work um there is that thing that people always say you know just try and be chill sure we'll do um but i i genuinely think for me that is what made the fourth one the the one what was it like telling people uh amazing it was amazing um, telling my family and my sisters and my brother and my nieces and nephews and, yeah, and all my friends. It was amazing. And I'll never get, like, I've never had that where you get to tell someone you're engaged or you get, you know, your wedding day or, you know, I've never had any of that. So it was like, it felt, uh, yeah, like a, just amazing. Um yeah. There must have also been a sense of kind of like, oh, my God, this is actually happening. Oh, shit. Yeah. I mean, it was amazing. And then I was like, oh, sweet Jesus. <laughs> what in God's name have I done? Can I do this? Um, and I was also grieving a life that I thought I was going to have, like with a lovely husband and a nice house in the country and, you know, and five kids running around and 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 i was and i still had to totally process that that wasn't going to happen um and not to say it couldn't still happen i could still fall in love but it it wasn't going to be the way that i'd anticipated it was going to happen um and that really came about whilst i was pregnant rather than before it that that's interesting yeah um it was because it was so definite like the baby was coming and he was coming without me being in love and without me, you know, having gone on mini moons or whatever people do. And, you know, all of that kind of thing. It just that hadn't happened. And, I, and that those thoughts were only really there when I was pregnant. Before that, not so much. What was your pregnancy like? Oh, hideous. Absolutely hideous. I was sick the whole way through. Um, yeah, I was really sick. I would fall asleep. My friend found me asleep on the drive. I, I was sick until I was the thinnest I've been at 40 weeks pregnant for years. Like I, I was so ill and tired and yeah, I didn't, that was another thing. I was just a bit gutted that I just didn't enjoy it at all. Um, because, because I just felt so shit, you know, and you're like, are you kidding? Why do people have more than one? Um, or people who are just like, oh, no, I didn't feel anything. You're like, are you kidding me? You know. Um, so, yeah, sadly, there was about two weeks when I was about 30 weeks pregnant where I felt quite good. Other than that, I was just like, no, get it out. I'm done. This is, this is not cool. <laughs> I kept thinking, <laughs> I, I made this happen. I've longed for this. Like, my God's name's going on. It was... Did it make you worry about what was to come? Or did you know that, did you kind of feel like actually after the, the sickness and the feeling like this can only last so long? Yeah. 
did it give you hope for what was to come and getting the baby out? I was just desperate to get the baby out. I was like, I can't feel this bad for ages. Um, and then the first three months of, of newborn baby happened. I was like, oh, shit, I can feel quite bad for a long time. <laughs> Who knew? <laughs> like, oh, my God, what have I done? Well, get there, Liv. So, labour. Yeah. How did you decide mm. who to have with you? Oh, well, as ever with me, I was just like, anyone? You all? You all there? <laughs> so I had three, so I had two sisters, my two sisters and my friend um, in because I just thought the more the merrier. And if one of them couldn't come or they needed support. So, yeah, all three of them were there for the whole 900 hours that I was in labour. How was your labour? I mean, again, gee, it wasn't ideal. Uh, I was induced at 42 weeks. Um, so I was due on the 1st of April and he came on the 16th. <gasps> yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah, yeah. And I had, yeah, everything that could have gone wrong did. Although I'm not, I'm lucky, I'm not traumatised by my birth at all. I can't, I remember what happened, but I can't remember how I felt, other than shouting a lot, this is barbaric. <laughs> It's 2018, make it stop. Um, yeah, but actually, looking back, I don't remember. I, I get why people have That is one. a running theme for you. I don't remember. I block it out. I literally block it out. If I don't like it, I block it out. Yeah, I need to look into that. Definitely. Did you know that you were having a boy? Yes. I really wanted a boy. Uh, I couldn't tell you why. Or I literally, I don't know why I wanted a boy. We're a family of girls, maybe that's why, but I wanted a boy. Um, I'd have been thrilled with a girl, of course I would. But yeah, for no reason. I was like, it, he needs to be a boy. Um, and when I went to find out, the sonographer said, do you want to find out, you know, with the sex? And my sister just looked at her and went, depends what the answer is. <laughs> like, <laughs> don't tell her if it's a girl. Um, but actually, I, obviously, I wouldn't have cared. Um, but yeah, I found out. I'm really nosy. So there's no way I could have gone 10 months without finding out what was happening inside me. I needed yeah. to know. And um, what was it like meeting him for the first time? Honestly? <laughs> I'm all about honesty because there's so much pinned on this moment and I think it's really important that we are honest about it, that it does, it's not the same for everyone. I actually had this conversation with some friends today who are due their first baby because um, they asked my opinion. I didn't just launch at them. But I didn't feel that rush that I wanted at all. I assumed the heavens would open and it would be like, la, 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 la. Uh, and actually, and also I thought I was going to get, in my head I was getting a really chubby baby because I was so overdue and they kept telling me I was having a big baby. Um, and so I was just expecting this chubby little thing and actually a very skinny, long, little thing came out and I, my sister said I was terrified of showing him to you because I knew you wanted this fat baby and then Herb was like the absolute opposite um and I just apparently I looked at my sister and my and just went is that one mine <laughs> she's like yes darling it is oh god and yeah I'm still really sad about that that I didn't feel that um urge that kind of oh amazing not that I didn't love him and I and I was thrilled he was healthy and I was thrilled he was there but I I didn't have the surge of that's it that's everything I've ever wanted right there I just didn't have it does it make you feel better hearing other people share that thought yes and I can't believe or it could just be that my friends never had it of course like um, but I'd never heard anyone say that, ever. Do you think, uh, maybe it's that thing as well, because of all the films and TV and stuff, it's oh, all so Jesus. romanticised. Yeah, 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 so yeah, that's yeah. the version that we get. We don't yeah. actually hear any other version. No. So we don't share it. Friends won't share it because actually, oh, I can't Because they'll that. feel like a bad person. Yeah, yeah. completely. 
Um, and even after that, like when I'd had him and I had him at 10 to midnight, <clears throat> like I say, it had been going on forever. And so my poor sisters and friend needed to leave to go home to see their families <laughs> and sleep and get over it. And uh, so they left and suddenly you're just there on your own. I, I couldn't feel I'd had to have general anaesthetic because he was a forcep delivery. So I couldn't feel move or feel from below the waist. And then they're suddenly trying to put him on your boob to breastfeed. And it all just felt like I just remember being overwhelmed at that stage. Like, I just want to go to sleep, please. Can I go to sleep? Is the baby OK? Yes. OK, great. Can I go to sleep now? Um, because it was just, well, I was exhausted, obviously, like all mothers are at that stage. Um, oh, so I think when you're physically not yourself, yeah. it's very hard. Yeah, completely. Um, and of course you don't know what's going to happen. or And of course no one can prepare you and, you know, all of those things. But yeah, I was really shocked by how I felt. That's not to say I wasn't pleased. Of course I was thrilled and I loved him. I knew I loved him, but I didn't have that, um, like I say, rainbows and stars moment. Why did you call him Herb? Uh, so he, oddly, against all odds, was born on my dad's birthday. And my dad called me Little Herbert. <laughs> yeah, so he was, he was Herb. Had to be. Did you at any moment feel like your mum and dad were in any way sort of supporting you, especially with that totally. date? Completely, because he, uh, because Herb was so late, like it had never been a, an option that he'd be born on dad's birthday. Yeah. Ever. We'd all, you know, that wasn't even something like, oh, wouldn't that be nice? It just yeah. wasn't an option. Um, and so the fact that he came nearly 17 days late on dad's birthday I was just like okay they're okay with this this is all good and actually I have a painting of my dad that Herb that was the first thing that Herb ever kissed like off his own back yeah really weird just went up and kissed it and you're like oh my god what's happening had you ever explained to him no I had no idea who it was Really weird, really weird. I can't think about things like that too much because it's just odd. But yeah, he just went up and kissed this painting of my dad. Bonkers, bonkers. What was it like taking Herb home? Because you're like me, you found the first few months hard. pretty tricky, yeah. Yeah, yeah, so hard. Taking him home, I was thrilled to be leaving the hospital. And I was really excited to go home and actually having my sisters, I suspect, well, I know I had a different scenario to a lot of people that often if you're taking your first baby home as a couple, like neither of you have any idea what's going on. You're running around <laughs> like headless chicken saying, oh my God, is, is this hot enough? Is this cold enough? Yeah. Are they latching? Um, whereas I had two seasoned mothers there um, which was amazing, you know, so when I was panicking, they were like, no, I think what we could do now is X, Y, Z. Um, and, but the, the raw emotion of it hit me like a ton of bricks and the physical pain I was in. Um, I had, I just hadn't thought about it because I'm an idiot. I hadn't thought about the after. I was so excited about being a mother and having a baby and I hadn't thought about the physical aspect of that on my body I don't think many people do no. because so much is about the birth you don't get anything about the after no after. at all and even in the NCT classes that I did I mean I missed quite a few classes for various reasons so it may be that it was covered so this isn't anything against them but there was nothing about you afterwards there was about don't put the baby next to a radiator or, you know, things like that, practical things, but nothing about the fact that you would feel like your body was likely to be on fire and you were going to have to do a poo that would feel like death. You know, just things like that that I didn't know. And again, thankfully, my sisters were there going, this is totally normal, you're fine. Um, 
And I remember my poor midwife doing the rounds, you know, and they come round to your house afterwards. And she'd barely got her foot in the door and I was on the sofa with my legs open going, is this all normal? Is this OK? You know, she's like, yeah, everything's totally fine. I'm like, oh, OK, sorry. She's like, do you want me to check anything else? Like the poor girl just <laughs> literally hadn't even been offered a cup of tea. There I was. Um, I had exactly the same experience. So I think a lot of people just go, can you just look? Just check it. Please? Can you please? Yeah, literally. <laughs> I can't even remember your name, but please check. And at that stage, God, I'd gone through fertility. People were constantly up there fiddling around. It made no difference. Um, yeah. But, yeah, things like that, I just, it was, yeah, it really threw me. Um, but luckily, like, things like the weather was lovely. So, and um, we used to live next to a meadow, so I could just go out with him and walk around a meadow in the sunshine and, and things like that totally saved me from just being like what in god's name is happening what have i done i remember thinking what have i done and oh my god this maybe... which i think is quite a difficult question to ask yourself when you when you know that you're such a maternal person and in that in, when uh, and, uh, and i always felt like whenever i was around friends with kids being with the kids was my safe was my comfortable place almost Absolutely. so then to have a baby and feel like oh my god I have not got a maternal bone in my body yeah. I don't know what I'm doing and I don't I'm know not who handing I am. this one back yes yeah exactly that and I remember thinking what on earth have I done what you know all the people that although no one's ever said to me you've made a mistake you know this is a ridiculous thing to do but you know that there are people that won't agree with what I've done and I, was, and I was like, maybe they're right. Like, maybe I shouldn't have done this. Um, but actually, that was just my body being exhausted and tired and not knowing what was going on. And I suspect people who have children with their partner feel the same sometimes about, oh, my God, should we have had a kid? You know. I think it's still a thought that, can't, that you feel like you can't vocalise. It's still yeah. a thought that you kind of like almost you're the you're failing in a yeah. way because you're not you're not the mum that you thought you would be. be you're failing the baby you're failing your partner you're failing yourself and so I think maybe that is still a thing because I mean I know that you posted something for maternal mental health week I don't know if it was this year or last year yeah and it just it, I mean it could have been for me and I and I felt exactly the same yeah um and I think it's so important that we share those feelings um, because so many people, like the leading cause yeah. of death in new mums is suicide. And I just think if we all shared and said, you're not on your own, it's okay to feel that way. If you feel beyond it, go and get help. But, you know, just know that, you know, you can talk and not feel judged. And even not if you go beyond that, but even if you're five out of 10 feeling that, call your doctor, yeah. say, or, or a friend or whoever, but the chances are you're going to be okay. Um, yeah. And there are obviously caveats to that and some people need much more help. Um, but I did not think I would be feeling like that for one second because I'd longed for this so much. I'd got myself in debt to make this happen. I'd, you know, I'd gone against the grain of again, quote unquote, normal reproduction to make this happen. And I didn't feel fluffy and, and lovely, you know, I felt shit. And, and I remember my sister, bless her, said, I, I can't remember how old her was, maybe three weeks, said, do you want me to take him back to mine for a night? Because actually, bless her, she wanted to see her own children. Yeah. <laughs> um, and I was like, absolutely, yeah. And she was like, are you sure? I'm like, yeah. And I didn't, for one second, think, oh, God, where is he? I never had that. And I was like, oh, shit, maybe this is a problem. But actually, when he came home the next day, so he wasn't even gone 18 hours, I don't think. But when he came home the next day, I was thrilled. Uh, and I was like, oh, okay you know, this is going to be fine. Um, and then day on day on day, it got to now when I'm obsessed with him. 
And a lot of people don't have that. Some people do have the flowers and rainbows, and that's brilliant. Mm. But it's really important to acknowledge that sometimes it's just a bit shit. <laughs> Did you feel it hard to admit that you were struggling? Uh, to certain people, yeah. And actually, I found it easier. I mean, this is the most ridiculous thing I will probably ever say, but I found it easier to say to Instagram, I'm struggling. Or, or that I think it's the post you're thinking of where I said, we've been together for three weeks and it's mm. been a ride, uh, you know. Um, but I couldn't have had that conversation with one person, one to one. I'd have really struggled, I think, um, and which is odd because saying it to a public platform where people could have easily said, "You're horrible. Why don't you, you know? Why are you feeling like this?" Um, but actually, the opposite was true. There were people, a lot of people, DMing me, going, "Oh, thank God, I've been feeling like this. You know, my kid was born." two weeks after you or a week before or whatever and thank you because I thought I was losing it and I was like well we may both be losing it I can't (laughs) (laughs) you know you're like please for god's sake don't take what I say as gospel ever um but if you're losing it I am too we'll do it together type thing um yeah when did you feel that cloud starting to lift were you aware of it happening or was it just a slow it was quite slow, I think. I mean, the first, like, oh, this is going to be OK, was when Herb came back when he'd stayed at my sister's that night. Um, but when it started to not feel like an uphill struggle, where I felt more confident, like I knew what I was doing. I bought a book about routine. I always thought I'd be someone who didn't like routine in kids. Turns out I bloody loved it. <laughs> because it was just someone, it felt like someone was holding my hand going, this is how we suggest it is. You don't have to follow it to the letter, but, you know, just something to guide me. Um, and so I started following that and just building my confidence. And I think it was about when he was maybe six weeks old where I was like, oh, cool, I've got this. And then I went out to the local coffee shop place and parked the car and tried to use my goddamn buggy and I couldn't use it and I threw it across the car park because I couldn't make it go up and I remember just sitting on the car park floor crying just being like I just want to take him to the M&S to get some coffee um yeah and just being like and then I thought I thought I was getting it and no there's something else now that's just swiped my feet away again and actually I just needed a new buggy (laughs) (laughs) just bought a shit buggy (laughs) that's my one tip to people is practice with your buggy practice with your bloody buggy before the baby comes because what you don't want to be doing is crying in a car park throwing your buggy at other people's cars I didn't hit any because it was too heavy but I really wanted to Did anyone come over and help? A man, bless him, came, poor guy actually, just came and said, are you okay? And I was like, I'm going to be fine. And he said, okay, should I walk away? And I was like, yes, I think so. And he said, I'll come back in a minute and check to see, you know. I don't know if he did because I scarpered. (laughs) I got back in the car and went home. I suspect he did. I don't think anyone would have not. But yeah. Um, But that wasn't because loads of people walked past and ignored yeah, yeah, yeah. me that just he was the only one that walked past um yeah just ridiculous things like that that you don't think of that a buggy could break you like god just learn to pull the right lever Liv it's not <laughs> <laughs> God say I mean just ridiculous how has the reality of doing it all alone compared to the thought of it beforehand uh it's really different in terms of what's hard and what isn't so the loneliness is constant so uh just the not the loneliness so much as physical loneliness but um of making all the decisions Mm. Uh, like all the decisions there's nothing that isn't your decision what 
they're having for tea, uh, what electricity company you use, what is the best tea there, what nappies you should use, you know, what mortgage to get, where should you go on holiday, everything stops with you. Um, and although I've been living on my own essentially since I was 17, and so I've always been making those decisions, they were flippant decisions before because it was only me. And now it's like, oh shit, you know, I can't screw this up um, because there's a baby involved and I don't, you know, want to do anything that would jeopardise his happiness. Or um, And then the other thing that I just didn't, not think about, I did think about it, but I didn't realise how much it would impact me, is financial. It, the uh, childcare... I have to work full time. Child, full time childcare has crippled me. I had to sell my house to get rid of my debts. To that wasn't all from childcare, but it all accumulated and accumulated, um, and that's tough. Like you just people, you see people, you know, going out for dinner all the time, and you're like, how are you doing that? Or, you know, I just want to take him to the local wildlife park, or whatever. And you're just like, mm, actually, that's forty quid. Like I can't fathom how people do it when they've got five or six kids or you know um so the the financial aspect has been a real eye-opener and so we we spend all of our time outside in fields which is amazing and we love it and he loves it but I occasionally like to take him somewhere else or you know buy something flippant or you know um so I think you know we're talking about Instagram before as a place of uh, somewhere that you can go that makes you how so you can get those other voices that make you feel good and make you feel heard. The other side of that is obviously that you see people going to and doing all those things and you're like, oh my gosh, we should be doing that. But the thing is, when you go and spend your money and you do that thing, no one's having a good time. No, that is so you know, true. You know, you can kind of, this is going to be a great day. And, and they're, they're in a bad But they're mood. not playing, yeah, and yeah, no one's yeah, playing yeah. ball. So you'd have been yeah. better off in the field that day, letting them just do whatever they wanted and running wild. So I think you, in a, in a big way, we can't always trust what we see. Oh, no, totally. And, and actually, a lot of that wasn't from Instagram because I know people, you know, I know when to put a filter on and when not. Not an Instagram filter, an actual <laughs> mind filter. Um, but but my friends, you know, who they just have really different lives because they've been mm. in a partnership for a long time. So you have a double income yeah, for a long time. And, and that actually rolls to make it more of an income, more of an income. Whereas if you're single, your income constantly becomes less and less and less. Um, and and so, yeah, that's just something I've had to work out how to deal with and do and, and make better. What is life like with Herb? Uh, amazing. He's a good kid. He's funny. Um, he's relentless. God, I mean, he's just turned two, so he is relentless. Oh, you're um, in a fun stage. Oh, mate. And he <laughs> is my son. He is as stubborn as an ox. And I see it in him, and I'm like, that is nothing to do with the donor. That is all me. That You know, Um but he's amazing. He's a fun kid. He's smiley. He likes people. Um, yeah, it's good fun. It's good fun. It's an adventure. Do you, yeah. Do you think about when he's older and how you will bring, will you talk to him about the Absolutely. donor? Because I know that you, your friend has put it all together, all yeah. the file together. I know. Um, yeah, my friend... God love him, illustrated a whole little book for me about all of... Well, basically, I'm a really aesthetic person. I'm, I need to see things. And uh, the the file you get is just gross, black and white Word document. And I was like, I can't give Herb that, going, here's your history. You know, it's just really <laughs> shitty. Um, and so I asked a friend who's a designer to... If he'd do it for me, and God love him, he did the most beautiful... So everything's an illustration of what he said, you know, so there was uh, holidays he'd been on and things. And so there were illustrations of the holidays or the first car he had and things like that. And it's just really beautiful. Um, 
but I'll tell Herb as soon as he as as soon as it's something that he can gauge properly. Mm-hmm. He's not my dirty little secret. I won't shield anything from him. Um, I'll tell him. I'll tell anyone who asks. You know, that's again why I want to write a book. I really, yeah, I want it to be normalised. Um, not that it takes away from any other way of having a child, but it is a way of having a child. Um, and yeah, he'll know, and he'll know that he came because I wanted him so desperately, and he came, you know, just full of love. Uh, as shit as that sounds, it's true. He'll he'll know that he was totally wanted. I, I I've read somewhere that you said that your donor is had also said that he is happy to be contacted at a later stage, and that he loves the idea of someone turning up for a cup of tea. Honestly, when I read that, I wept. No, honestly, it makes me a bit weepy. He so um, it's an open donor, which is now standard which means that Herb can contact him when he's 18. It was quite apparent throughout the choosing process that some of them were donating because they needed some cash. And some of them had thought through how this could implicate their life in 18 years' time. And yes, so this particular... Quite a few donors said it, but this particular donor said, I really would welcome having a coffee with whoever knocks on the door. You know, and you're like, oh, my God, you sound lovely. Can I knock on the door? You know. Um, so, yeah, so he was, so Herb will be able to if he wants to. But that's his decision. That's nothing to do with me. Um, I'll, I'll have made enough decisions for him by that stage. So uh, <laughs> I'll, I'll stay out of that one. Um, but God I damn it, I'm not to. A friend of mine contacted me about a year ago and said, have you ever had anyone on that's gone, like, that's fallen pregnant this way? Because that's where, what I would like to do. I'm 36 next year. Yeah. Yeah, And I think actually letting people know that they have options, that you don't, you know, you don't have to, you know, don't have to have one thing to get the other. And actually having, you know, you don't I just think it's very hard especially as a woman where we are doing so many things so much later yes yeah, but yeah, we yeah. still have a time frame on having a baby and it, that's really tough yeah um yeah there's always a time frame and you're always you know should have should have gone through a lot of emotions to be able to have that conversation with you yeah um that's the thing is is that it isn't an easy thing to admit to yourself that all the things you'd planned in your head because I mean I can't say for everyone but I would have thought not everyone will be 12 going can't wait to buy sperm do you know what I mean it's that just isn't how we are are brought up to think um and so you have to like I said before you have to go through a kind of grieving process that it isn't going to be how you thought it was and uh, the the decisions people have to make to get to that place are tough. They're really yeah. tough. Um, and no matter how thrilled and happy people are when they've had the baby, they've gone through some shit to get there. So tell her to call me. <laughs> oh, I will. Yeah, Thank too. you, Liv. Thank you. Um, so I wrote a book about uh, motherhood. Yeah. Uh, I've written a couple now. Uh, but this year I wrote one called Letters on Motherhood, yeah. which is all about letters around motherhood. If you could write a letter on motherhood, who would it be to and what would it say? Actually, you did one for me online. I did, yeah. I'd write it to the donor every day of the week. I would tell him that he's a hero. He's my hero. Like, he made my dreams come true. And he doesn't know that. It blows my mind that he's just going around his day-to-day life worrying about COVID, probably, not knowing how frigging cool Herb is. And also, because he, he just wouldn't know who was successful and who wasn't. No, he has no idea. He knows he donated. And he will find out that he had a successful pregnancy, um, or two or four or whatever. It's very... Uh, there are limits to how many... Uh, successful pregnancies donors can have per country um, for obvious reasons Mm -hmm. Um, and yeah he doesn't know that 
like how freaking cool Herb is or how much joy he's brought me or that Herb might have a element of him in it. You know, there might be something Herb does that's very of his family, you know. Um, I don't know anything about him. I don't know if he's happy. I don't know if he's, you know... I'd just love him to know, you know, if he's having a shit time, I'd love him to know that he made my dreams come true. Like, he really did. He's he's a rock star. Total rock star. What is it like now, being at those barbecues that you're at when you had your godson in your hand and you had that moment? What's it like now being at those, well, obviously not in COVID (laughs) times, but being when you can be surrounded by friends, what is it like being there with your son I feel less alone I feel less internally alone not physically alone obviously but I feel less internally sad actually that ache that sort of acute ache isn't there I can leave those parties happy and unless he's been a complete (laughs) shitbag um (laughs) But yeah, you know, I can leave those parties not desperate. I'm bloody lucky. Does motherhood make you think about your parents? All the time. Fuck, all the time. God, gee, I'd got through this whole thing without crying. (laughs) I can't imagine how hard that was for them. How? They were so young when they died. They were, dad was... 49 and mum was 50 they were babies and they had to say goodbye to their kids and and know that they had to say goodbye you know they both had long periods of illness so it wasn't so they they had to plan it and I I just don't know how I don't know how people do that I just so that every day I'm every day I see her I'm just like crying I can't ever say goodbye to him. And also, just, I'm sad for Herb that he won't have grandparents. Um, You know, I see people whinging about their parents all the time, and I know I would if mine were alive, you know, but the grandparents bring around a stupid present, or they spoil them too much, or... You know, they go and pick them up from nursery and take them to the park and things like that. And I'm really sad her won't have that. But he's got a lot of other things, you know, just not grandparents. <laughs> so, yeah, it makes me think about them all the time. I did it. <laughs> <laughs> you absolutely did. Yeah. And I just love the fact that Herb came on your dad's birthday. I mean, it's ridiculous, isn't it? It's so ridiculous. Yeah, I've got a drawing that my dad drew of me when I was about seven with dad's writing saying Little Herbert on it and my writing saying, in other words, Olivia. And uh, (laughs) I've got that above Herb's bed. So he can always have some of his granddad's drawings. I say granddad. My dad always said if he ever had grandchildren, he wanted them to call him sir. (laughs) So I should maybe start... (laughs) Should maybe start referencing him as Sir uh, whenever Herb kisses his painting. God damn it. So that's how ridiculous it would have been had he have been around still. But yeah. It must also make you look back and realise how much of a baby you were oh, having I to can't. say goodbye to parents and yeah. how much that would have impacted your life. Completely. I there's so much about it that is coming back now that um that I never thought it impacted my life at all genuinely if people had said god that must have been tough I'd be like no it's fine um and I think in some respects that's because it started when I was eight so I genuinely don't know any better um but also because I knew I had to every time someone got better someone else got ill then someone else died, then someone else got ill, then someone else got better, then someone else died. You know, and it was this constant. So I knew I had to be strong all the time. Um, and I, remember, I asked my sisters the other day if I ever had counselling. And, and at mum's hospice, they had a counsellor there, obviously. And my sister's like, yeah, 
you had counselling, but you convinced them you were fine. And I was like, yeah, that's typical me. Like, I convinced them I was totally okay. And and so then have not had counselling since. And now, looking into it, too late. I mean, motherhood late, just strips you and it, ma- it brings out such a rawness. So yeah. it's, you know. Yeah. Um, so things like that. And, and now looking at eight-year-olds, I'm like, God, or or 12, just thinking, God, my dad, I didn't have, like, I didn't have a friendship with my dad because I was 12. He was still my dad, you know. You know, that kind of friendship with your parents comes a bit later. Um, and, yeah, and then 17 to lose your mum is just shitty. It's just, it's crap time anyway. But, yeah, it really has made me think about all of that. And yeah, how very young I was and how I couldn't possibly have understood how it was impacting me or how it was going to impact me. And like my like my total fear of of abandonment that I've realised now is why I I don't really have I've never had a successful relationship because of all that. And it's things that's only been realised like in the last year I'm like oh yeah that makes sense of course I don't want people to come near me because then they could leave you know which is crazy that I've just been sitting on that and actually I need to go and get that shit sorted like just like that <laughs> it's fine ridiculous yeah carrying it with you for decades yeah, but yeah, now no, just, just like that <laughs> probably a couple of sessions a couple of short sessions so silly it's crazy how motherhood makes you understand yourself a little bit more, though. Yeah, when you think you're completely lost, you think it's broken you. Um, and actually, every time it breaks you, you put, to, you put yourself together again with an added bit. You're like, oh, shit, mm. yeah, OK. Like a jigsaw that's just got the edges. And you keep yeah. losing a piece and you're like, oh, no, it's back. There's another bit. It's fine. It's going to be fine. Liv, I finished the podcast with you completing three sentences. Oh my God, okay. Yeah. Being a mum means... Everything. To me, everything. I'm bloody lucky, and I know I am. Since having a child, I... Have... I've found out a lot about myself. Yeah. And I'm happy when? He's not going through a developmental leap. (laughs) 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 Uh, Yeah, no, when when I'm with him and my whole family and all my nieces and nephews and, yeah, that's good. I'm very lucky. Liv, thank you so, so, so much. I've absolutely loved chatting to you. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you, Jean.